everybody and welcome back to another episode of the war of ideas today we have a very special guest i have the great honor of interviewing uh dr brian kaplan he is an economist of the libertarian persuasion he has written multiple books on some of our most controversial and uh, let's say most public facing political issues from his market-based economic perspective i am very excited to get into it with him um, so I'm not going to hold you up any longer, um, and we will invite him on. Uh, Brian, it's, uh, it's great to have you. Thank you very much for having me. Great to be here. Okay, so uh, before I ask you my millions of uh, very specific questions, um, I want to ask you a more general one, which is um, how did, could you uh, give us a little bit of overview about the kind of structure of your economic beliefs and kind of how you came to believe them? All right. Good question. I mean, I went to UC Berkeley uh, and got my economics degree there. So it's a very normal department. <clears throat> got my PhD from Princeton. I mean, if you go back a bit. So I guess in 12th grade, I discovered Austrian economics, which seemed great to me at the time. I then over time learned, well, there's actually a lot of problems with that. And I would say I actually just learned a lot of mainstream economics Probably the main thing that I picked up was a lot of interest in behavioral economics, which is also known as psychology and economics. Uh, this is really what is probably most important for my work is I just take very seriously how actual human beings think and feel and think that if we're really going to understand anything about the economy, we've got to start with looking at actual human beings and seeing whether they fit the models or not. Sure. So um, I... Um... I've been very interested in Austrian economics for a long time as well. Um, what issues did you see with it? Well, you I know, actually you know a lot of background, but let me put it this way. There's a, there are a lot of technical points in Austrian economics, which just seem odd. Like, why do you care about this so much? For example, there's a standard thing among Austrian economists saying you can never be indifferent about two things. You always have a strict preference for things because you can't reveal indifference with your behavior. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe. And then they try to use this to say things like complaints about pollution aren't really valid complaints because you can't prove that someone doesn't like pollution because they're just sitting there coughing. Uh, this is may seem like a parody, but it's not really. There is a lot of reverse engineering in Austrian economics of saying that textbook complaints about markets are just logically invalid and we're just not going to consider them, which, again, if you like the political implications, sound great. But if you got some common sense, it really does come down to – so you're saying that if an asteroid is coming straight for Earth but nobody makes an effort to stop it, that proves that they don't care? rather than say each person realizes that there's not much they can do about it, and so they're not doing much about it, not because they don't care, but because they think it's hopeless. So that's where I would really focus. Right. Uh, the, um, that underlying assumption does seem a bit weird that you have to be doing something in order to care. Um, yes, and, but it is the kind of thing that Austrians push very hard, and at first you're like, all right, if you care that much, I guess I'll give it to you. It was like, oh, you're trying to use this to trump a bunch of totally reasonable complaints. Right. All right. I, mean, I understand where it's coming. On, on the other hand, I do understand what it's coming from. Um, yeah, I mean, like, of course, there's the issue of how do you know that a person who doesn't do anything actually cares versus just say, say oh, I care so, so much. Right. Like the One great thing about – Regular economics is they realize there are ways you can do this. For example, if someone says they really care about crime, then you could look and see, well, where do you live? Do you live in a high crime area? And how much extra money is it costing you to get out of that high crime area? And if you're paying a lot of money to avoid crime, that's pretty convincing evidence you actually care. On the other hand, if you don't, suggest you don't care very much. Oh. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, un unbelievable uh, insights there. Um, speak louder than words. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I wanted to um, actually talk about, go through your books and the topics of those books. Um, because I read a little bit about each one of them and um, I've had some questions. So the first one I came across was um, the idea of rational irrationality. 
um, the kind of a basically somewhat of an indictment of democracy mm -hmm. um, in some ways. I, these books have been kind of getting more popular. Um, I know uh, Patrick Denise had um, a book called uh, A Regime Change. It was kind of a post-liberal book that I found was interesting. Um, so I'm curious, first of all, what is rational irrationality? What is that exactly? Why and how does that relate to voters? All right, here's the best example. You're arguing with someone who says, look, Trump will definitely win in 2024. There's no doubt about it. It's absolutely certain. And you're looking at them and like, are you going for an Oscar? And they're like, no, no, this person really believes it. Then you say, okay, great. It's absolutely certain. How about you give me 10 to 1 odds for a bet? And then watch them run away. <laughs> right. right. Now, one story here is that they were lying the whole time and the offer to bet just exposed them. They thought it was pl plausible, but they didn't really think it was absolutely certain. They're just engaging in hyperbole for recreation. But again, it just seems that that's hard to believe a lot of times. People get co so caught up in their own nonsense. So I say what's really going on when you offer to bet someone, it's not that they actually then reveal that they were lying, but rather they calm down under those incentives and rethink their position and realize, oh, yeah. It's actually not absolutely certain. In fact, it's probably more like one in four. I don't want to give someone 10 to one odds when one to four odds are the actual appropriate odds. So that's the best way of revealing what I call rational rationality. Just ask someone to bet and you'll see that changing incentives changes the level of intellectual discipline that people apply to their ideas. Sure. So now, this doesn't just apply to politics. You can see it applies to a wide, wide range of things. So there's a lot of areas where people are passionate about. So people are passionate about philosophy or religion, politics, sports sometimes. And yet their irrationality is very high. Their passion is unrestrained when they're just talking. But when some practical consequences of error are placed on the table, people change the way they think. That's why I call it rational irrationality. People are being irrational. They're being unreasonable about the way they form their views. They're unreasonable about their confidence. But there's a method to the madness. They're not crazy all the way down, which is why I can't actually get people to bet their houses against my dime. Right, uh, rather, right. what's going on is that it's the kind of irrationality where on some deeper level, they realize that they are playing fast and loose with reality. And if you change the dial of the incentives – you then change the way that they think about the issue, which shows that they actually are capable of being much more reasonable than they were before. So really, it comes down to the idea that incentives actually change people's irrationality for the better, so that when people are just talking freely, their views tend to be at their worst. And when they are under the bet, the pressure of a bet, that's when their views are as good as they're going to get. Right. This seems uh, somewhat similar to the uh, the Austrian assumption that we were talking about earlier. Um, now, it's not exactly the same thing, but the mm -hmm. idea that people's ideas and real beliefs are only revealed once they have like some real skin in the game. Um, as, but when mm -hmm. they're just saying that they care, that's less uh, credible. It's interesting because mm -hmm. the rational irrationality idea seems to agree that there's a kernel of truth to that at least yeah. i mean, I mean yeah. like like so like this Aust this weird austrian view it starts with common sense which is maybe people are lying maybe they're exaggerating maybe they're not being very thoughtful mm -hmm. the problem comes when the austrian says if you aren't revealing something in action then it doesn't even exist right that's the yeah. point where it just gets metaphysical and there's an agenda of course of just saying i'm refusing to consider a giant pile of evidence but yeah but the common sense point of people are not always honest that actions speak louder than words that's a great point it's one that good economists who have never heard of austrian economics also are aware of although yeah there's also some bad economists who take things at face value especially when it coincides with their political agenda. You know, there's yeah. lots of political agendas. I, I don't mean to just beat up on Austrians. They're all, hardly the only ones who've got that issue. No. And yeah. yet when they're my friends, I'm harder on them because I don't want my friends to be wrong. Well, that makes you a, a good friend, I think. Try. Uh, what school of economics would you say you belong to? So the, the, the one that I would feel most comfortable with is just behavioral economics. So also known as psychology and economics, uh, the 
area of economics where they take psychology very seriously, where they care a lot about what human beings actually think and feel. I don't think of it as a political thing. I think of it rather as a common sense position, what you're going to go and study human behavior without wondering what human beings think and feel. That's stupid. So don't be stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't be stupid. It's a, right. it's a good motto. Yeah, um, I mean, okay. I would say that with the main area where I differ with other behavioral economics is I just care about a lot more psychology than they do. The right. problem with behavioral economists, in my view, is just that there's only a few areas of psychology they study, and I'm interested in the whole field. Uh, for example, I'm really interested in personality psychology. Do you have a personality, John? I, I think so. But Yes, uh, uh, my view is everybody's got one, and there's a lot of great research on this. And even most economists who say they're into psychology don't care much about personality. You know, I'm, in, I'm into intelligence research. I'm really into something that most behavioral economists never talk about, which is social desirability bias. It's the theme of... The, it was really the organizing idea behind the book that I'm writing now. And it just says that when the truth is ugly, people lie. Mm. Mm. Yeah, um, we will get there. Um, uh, cool. So one of, another question I had is um, about that irrational irrationality. The book then tends to argue or um, indict democracy mm -hmm. um, in this way, which is just how can it work when the vast majority of voters are ra – because – because voting isn't like betting. Voting is no, it is not. <laughs> voting is pretty. Because, voting is really talking. That's all yeah. it is. Okay, and so what implications does this have for democracy for you? Um, do you mm -hmm. think the big implication is that voters are off their rockers? Voters are out of their minds. Not just the ones who disagree with me either. Everybody, pretty much. Like you know, politics is like a religion. The incentives of democracy get people to think in a totally religious way. They're not interested in facts. They're not interested in argument. They're interested in consistency yeah. with a pile of dogma. So yeah, that's what democracy does. It bring it brings people and hands them power well, like with incentives that, that that bring out the very worst in them. So that's what, what is the alternative? Uh, what would you? Um, I mean, this is the million dollar question, right? So it's not, it's not fair to have, to think that you're going to have a perfect answer here, but I am still going to ask, which is, uh, if democracy is so bad, uh, what's the, uh, what's the alternative? Uh, what would you recommend to modify yeah, well, it? Or, sure. Well, definitely, definitely not dictatorship, which is even worse. Right? Uh, you know, there's interesting questions about the incentives of dictators. I do say the dictators tend to be more clear minded. Like when, if you were to go and ask people, like, like you know, will, will people leave the workers' paradise? Like, like the answer that people want to believe dogmatically is no, no, of course not. Whereas when you're an actual communist dictator, you realize, oh yes, people will definitely want to leave this workers' paradise. We must shoot them. Right? So, yeah. So dictatorship Real. brings out terrible things to people too in a different way. Uh, but in terms of what we can do to make things better, you know, step one is really like with an alcoholic. Just admit you have a problem. Step one for Alcoholics Anonymous, admit you have a problem. Step one for democracy is admit it's not a good system. It is a system that brings out people's intellectual worst. Well, good luck with that. For <laughs> yes, but yeah, like it's, a, it's just a basic point. Like This is not a, a situation where people get together and have an intelligent conversation. It's one where we have a giant dogmatic pseudo conversation where we yell at each other and repeat a bunch yeah. of dogma. Both sides, all sides, are generally terrible in democracy. Never forget that. Now, in terms of what can be done once we accept that, well, for one thing, there are a lot of limitations on democracy. You can either say they're not democratic or you can redefine democracy so that the First Amendment's democratic. I don't really care what labels you use, but the idea that limitations on majority rule improve things, I am totally down with that. Right. And just more generally trying to take more, as much as many things as we can outside of the realm where we vote on it. That's what the First Amendment does. It says we're not going to have an election over what religions are legal. They're, they're all legal. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? We're not going to have an election. We're not going to vote about what things you're allowed to say. Right. And I would say that you know, we're not going to have an election over whether or not you can go and regulate these industries. We're not going to have an election over whether there can be a progressive income tax. These are all useful mm. ideas to consider at minimum some more restrictions in democracy depoliticizing things to a, a high extent because politicized things are run poorly right right um so there's there's another question here that um 
is on the tip of my tongue and I'm starting to lose, unfortunately. Um, yes. So that first step, I think, is really the problem area. I mean, I think that one of the great strengths of our system is that democracy is very much on a chain, right? Like, as you say, we have things in our constitution that we can't vote on, at least not easily. And people don't really vote directly. They vote for the representatives. And that's all good. Um, designing to expand the list of, you know, constitutional amendments that we don't list, um, not regulating industry is a weird one, actually. Let's go there. Uh, you want to have sure. it in the constitution that the government can never regulate <laughs> industries? Right. Uh, so like at the end of Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, they put in a new amendment, which says Congress will pass no law bridging the freedom of production and trade. I mean, I would say that it probably makes a lot more sense to be more specific because that's, uh, that's sufficiently broad that it's just going to confuse people. But for example, uh, I think it would be great to have an amendment saying that Congress shall have, uh, you know, have, have no right to, pro to, uh, to prevent the immigration of people for residence and work. So Congress shall have no, no ability to say whether or not uh, any human being on earth can go and accept a job. Uh, I think that would be a great start. Um, there's actually, so I'm doing a new book on housing regulation there. It actually did get to the Supreme Court of the 1920s as to whether zoning was an illegal taking. It was a six to three vote, but there were three Supreme Court justices that said, you cannot have zoning. It's illegal. You're taking people's property from them. So no. Right. Uh, yeah. So I think that uh, vote was, that was a bad vote and they should have said that zoning's illegal. I got, um, I'm a big, uh, like constitutional law guy. I got to find that case and read it now. That's uh, you, you piqued my interest a hundred percent, but, um, I think the real trouble here is the first step, right? Because mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a big part of the dogma, I mean, especially on the left side of the aisle, but I mean, this is true on both sides of the aisle, although increasingly less so on the right as, you know, populists and post-liberals start to show up, which is um, democracy is our strength. Like democracy itself, like mm -hmm. as an abstract concept as being an unmitigated good is like a major part of the platform. And more than that, it's one of the major clubs that the left likes to hit the right with mm -hmm. uh, for being insufficiently mm -hmm committed to democracy and they bring up J6 and stuff like that. So it's hard for me to imagine how in this political universe, step one ever happens. Uh, do you mm -hmm. have an idea of how that would happen or is that just, uh, that just kind of how it is? Hmm. Yeah. Great question. I mean, I would say that populists, I think of them as being more vocally pro-democracy than the left actually. So you know, we're worth pointing democracy. out and actually probably more actually in favor of democracy. They're less likely to just say democracy equals whatever I want and more likely to say that it's just whatever the will of the people happens to be. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in terms of getting people to change their minds on this, I'd say that actually it's not that hard to get big concessions out of people, at least off the record. A lot of the problem is people don't want to say it publicly. Yeah. You know, like I talk to a lot of left wing professors and, and if they are saying, well, democracy is great, I say, well, doesn't it lead the people that you think are terrible to be in power about half the time? Like, yeah, well, that doesn't sound that great. <laughs> like, no, I guess it's not. Yeah. It's not that hard to get these concessions out of people. I mean, especially when you say like voters are rational. Well, you're like, no, they aren't. Well, how about the other side? Well, yeah, of course them. Right. And then from there, it's like, well, how about a bunch of people on your side who seem like their knowledge of the subject is fairly thin it's like, all right, I guess they're not all that rational either. So really it comes down to just you and a few of your buddies are rational and nobody else is, right? So in terms of getting that concession, I don't think it's so much hard to get it out of people, you know, regardless of their political views, really, as it's just hard to get them to publicly stand by the admission. Yeah, it's just the uh... – it's interesting how uh, deeply entrenched like that cultural like hands off is for democracy. Um, right. I mean, in a way, I would say the book that I'm writing right now, I in a way it is a big attempt to just get people to admit a lot of ugly truths. And how would you do that? I think the best way is actually by frontal assault and just say, look, you've got to admit there's a lot of ugly truths, right? Come on. Okay. There's ugly truths, yeah. obviously. And when you put it that way, it's hard to deny it <laughs> it's just a general point of those ugly truths. And once you get them to say that, it's like, all right, well, let's talk about some of them. Um, so the, what's, the, yeah, what's so, the name of the book? Oh, sorry? What's the name of the book? The book is called Unbeatable, The Brutally Honest Case for Free Markets. So it's about half done right now. I'm mm. very pleased with how it's going. I think it might ultimately be my best book. Uh, of course, uh, we will see. Um, so uh, what are some of the brutal truths? Uh, you mentioned zoning. Um, I know I'm from I'm from uh, Northern California. 
So um, kind of zoning regulations yeah. is a big part of the reason why um, house prices are so astronomically high, I mean, along with rent control, but mostly zoning yeah. as far as I'm aware. Uh, but what what other examples do you have? What other uh, brutal hmm. truth? Mean, this is one where I'd like to start with the really obvious ones, like nothing is perfectly safe. Yep. <laughs> nothing is perfectly safe. No solutions, only yes, trade-offs. Right. Yes, Right. This is one where like, like during COVID, all, all the people saying we have to do this because otherwise we won't be safe. It's like nothing's perfectly safe. We're always doing things that risk killing people. Like, you know, people say the pandemic's over. It's, it's a continuous variable. There's still people dying of COVID. We could be doing more in order to protect, protect them, but it's more important for people to enjoy life and have convenience than to save those lives. Right. That's the, an ugly right. truth. It's one um, that is built into any kind of sensible thinking about risk. And it's the, the policy power of the denial of this truth is immense. It's why we don't have driverless cars yet. Right. Because that's always to prove that driverless cars will never kill anyone. I can't prove that. They're going to kill people. They're going to kill fewer people than what we got right now. And they're super convenient. And it's a great product. The end. Therefore, let's go. That's it. Well. I think I think uh, I think the debate there's a little bit more complicated. Um, I will say though on the COVID thing is that it definitely, for those who think that we did the safe thing, people should start looking at the results of children in schools, like the uh, mm -hmm. the reading uh, literacy mm -hmm. um, test results cratered, cratered. Like no one say. dies from illiteracy, right? <laughs> no, yeah, nobody dies from um, lack of education. That doesn't seriously impact anybody's life, not yes. at all. Well, they're uh, not dead. Yeah, well, they're not dead, but yes. you, you know, it's it still definitely has a negative impact. As far as the driverless cars thing, though, I think that um, there's a couple more problems with that that I've had because I used to be really on the uh, driverless uh, cars train, um, but now I'm not so sure. And the reason for that is twofold, which is one, they will kill less people, but it's going to be a lot harder to find accountability for whenever they do mess up because mm -hmm. if the manufacturers or the people who write the algorithm aren't going to want to be on the hook every time it messes up. Like you basically have a philosophical trolley problem that you have to code for. Um, yeah. So you it's have not to that bad. It. They just buy some insurance, problem solved. Think so? Yeah. Think that's like, it? Like, it, it? like this is the kind of problem where obviously they would sell them. They know that they're in danger of getting sued and they're willing to take it because they've got a team of lawyers and they got insurance and they're going to go for it. That way. Right? I mean, it, like basically this is a problem where you might, it, like if I said, I'm going to go and start my own driverless car company, you as a friend might say, well, Brian, you might want to consider the liability. And I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah. But somebody's going to do it. They'll make a pile of money. They'll get screwed because the system will be, the legal system is messed up and unfair. But it's not going to stop us from getting driverless cars. Uh, what's really stopping is the regulation and just the, 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 like the terror of the system. Right. And then the second thing that is concerning is this is a point that gets brought up a lot by uh, people on my side of the aisle, which is um, the, the trucking industry, for example, um, and what it would do to the trucking industry. Now, I'm very familiar with the idea of creative destruction. I understand yep. that there'll be replacement jobs. Um, I understand that on the net, like across mm -hmm. the entire country, this will help more people than it hurts. However, it is going to hurt a certain amount of people very mm -hmm. badly. And that amount of people is not small. And it, they also probably won't be able to jump on the train of whatever is created mm -hmm. in the wake. Mm -hmm. What do you do with those people? What do you do with those millions who can't just learn to code um, mm -hmm. during the transition period? Well, I mean, ideally people will listen to my housing book and they'll get jobs in construction. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah. um, so you know, that, that is my big plan for helping the working class in general, not protectionism, but deregulating housing. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's, you know, like if people would listen to me on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, my honest answer is, look, the internet has already destroyed way more jobs than, than all of trucking. Mm -hmm. You just go down yeah, the road all the things, gradual, right? And it's like, like we're gonna, we're going to pass up the, this incredible opportunity. If you want to be really strict about this, you could just say, "Fine, we'll go and we'll give every retire every trucker you know, fifty thousand bucks for every year as a trucker, and that'll be their retirement or whatever, and then we'll move on." Yeah, you know, I mean, but, I, but yeah, I, but but to go and say we're we're going to hold this back because we have to save jobs in trucking again. This is really the same as keeping like, like the whole horse industry afloat. You know, that's a huge industry that got destroyed last time around. Right. Yeah. 
Um, I heard an idea from somebody that said that you re- you allow the self driving technology, but you basically artificially stagger it, so you just make sure it doesn't all happen at once, and you like slow mm-hmm. uh, slow down its entrance in the market, which creates a softer landing idea. Yeah, you oh, can do that. I mean, again, oh like the main God. issue with technology is normally that it's uh, the, that it comes too slowly because of coordination issues. Mm-hmm. Like this is at least you know like there's a lot of problems with electric cars, but one problem is. You don't want to build the stations until there's tons of cars and you don't want the car until there's tons of stations. Chicken right. the egg. And one of the best ways of doing it is just go, go gangbusters. Let's just go and put as many on the road as we can and just overwhelm it with the, with, with the numbers. Yeah. And, and yet regulation normally tries to slow things down. Like when, if anything, the sensible thing would be to try to speed it up. So yeah, anything where you're just trying to speed, uh, slow down the adoption of a new technology, I think is terrible. I mean, again, like the least bad thing that government could do other than nothing is just to go and say you get some money based upon how many years you were a trucker. Mm. I would be um, and that's something I would be uh, somewhat open to, I think. Um, and, and as far as the deregulation of the housing helping with this is the idea that if you deregulate housing, there's just going to be a ton of new jobs suddenly appearing. Um, is that the is that the idea? Brian, I think I lost you. We lost Brian. Oh, no. Um, He's frozen. Um, Okay. He is frozen, unfortunately, um, which you hate to see. I I can cover it until he comes back. Um, And I think the idea he was going with, with the deregulation of housing, is basically that the high regulation of housing and zoning is basically artificially limiting supply, which is absolutely true. Um, and it's happening in California. It's why it's part of why prices are so high. That and also the fact that uh, BlackRock and other large companies buy up a ton of it. So that, that, that's the other reason. But uh, part of the big reason is uh, zoning. Um, I think the point is that if you deregulate it, the boom in the amount of new housing being constructed right? Because there's high demand. That's why there are high prices. And now there's nothing artificially keeping that supply low. There's massive incentives for contractors to build. The only reason they're not building right now, thereby driving down the increasing supply and driving down the price. The only reason they're doing it right now is because of artificial restrictions um, with uh, zoning and regulation and like 10 miles of red tape. Um, So I think what he's saying that if you got rid of that, all of a sudden there'd be a lot more construction jobs that, uh, that younger truckers would hop into and the ones that are not that young can retire. Um, which at least is an answer. Like, you know, when you talk to cock to, um, like uh, Tucker Carlson talked to Ben Shapiro at some point and Ben Shapiro just kind of gave like the line about, um, creative destruction and stuff like that. And like, that's cool and all, but you have to give me a plan for what happens to the millions and millions of truckers after this happens. Um, so very, um, very much appreciate Brian actually giving an answer on that. That sounds somewhat palatable. Um, I could accept that for sure. Um, I could definitely accept that. Uh, we still do not know where Brian is, unfortunately, and we got all of his other books to get through here in a minute. Um, let me talk to the big bosses one second. We will see if he can come back. He doesn't actually talk to me, you see. He actually talks to uh, Travis. Um, I don't get direct contact with the talent. Um, Unfortunately, I'm just a lowly pleb. Um, So other things we're going to talk about, I'm going to give you a sneak peek. Um, Well, first of all, the democracy thing, I think he has a really clear head about this. I think he's absolutely right. I think that creating more constitutional amendments promote stability because there's less amounts of powerful, important things that we're constantly fighting over. People who love democracy um, feel like that's bad because we have to be able to evolve and change. And that's true. And that's why amendments can technically be added to the Constitution, although with great difficulty. But they forget that with the capacity for everything to change somewhat easily, um, you have an awful lot of instability because people don't know what's going to happen because like if um, people don't know what's going to happen because so many things are on the table to be changed, it creates a lot more polarization and it creates a lot less planning for the future because you know that the future is so subject to change. The more things that we can all agree should be basically off the table, the more assumptions we can make about the future of the country, the more we will share 
um, some basic values because if we didn't share them, they wouldn't we wouldn't agree to put them off the table. And the more you can have rational and um, somewhat secure predictions about the future of the nation, which allows for more long term thinking, which um, allows for economic stability. Um, and long term thinking is just the mark of economic prosperity. That's it's just it goes hand in hand. You can't think about long term thinking. You can't worry about uh, climate change. You can't worry about uh, your 401k when you're too worried about what you're going to eat tomorrow. Uh, but if you or or in our case, if you don't know if your savings are going to still exist once the next guy gets into office and has some inflationary policies, for example. But if you manage to uh, stop that kind of stuff. Um, then you can have more long-term thinking, more stability, and more unity, more order. We like order. We like um, we like order on on this show. But ha- order has to be balanced by you know change and humility. But uh, right now we don't have a lack of change. We have a lack of order, and we definitely have a lack of humility. Uh, so you know we are uh, we are pro ordered liberty uh, here on this channel. Um, My man is still gone, unfortunately, and I do not know if he will come back. I have sent an SOS and a a smoke, a a smoke uh, signal up to Travis, who lives in Canada. Awful place. Uh, Canada will soon be liberated by America at some point. Um, It will happen and it will be better for everybody. But until then, I have to send him smoke signals to hopefully get Brian Kaplan back. Um, it was seemed he was his connection seemed fine and this seemed very sudden so I imagine something kind of catastrophic happened on his end maybe uh, like Don Don last night his power went out out of nowhere maybe that happened to Brian or maybe his server went out or something uh, I don't know but um, the other books that we wanted to talk about is um, he had a book where I think he defended the idea of more kids for, as a selfish good um, as an economic good I um, I am very um skeptical of this because as we all know i love people having kids i think we i mean we're below replacement rates and i think having kids in almost all cases makes you a better person and also <clears throat> family is inherently good and moral um <clears throat> but in the modern economic society i would not argue that it's better for you economically people used to have kids partially because they were religious and moral but also partially because they wanted farm hands um and people to work with them now that's not really true anymore there's no real like economic benefit to having kids as far as i'm aware um he has returned brian has returned hold on screen freeze and i'm on another computer now yeah uh we you had a screen freeze too we lost you i had to uh entertain the masses by myself it was uh it was very scary for me um but i'm glad i have you back um i don't know what happened i'm sorry Looking, looking good though. Uh, this connection okay. looks okay. All right, hold on. I've just got. Okay, let's see. So I've just got. So like it's oh jeez. Okay. 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 All right. Yep. Now I'm good. All okay. Great. I'm glad we have you back. Don't know what happened there. I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that. Uh, what was I going to ask? Yeah, I was going to ask him. Um, I think I know what you're saying there, but um, with how would the deregulation of the housing market help people out of a job in the trucking industry? Oh my gosh, we lost him again. Oh no. Oh, he's back again. Can you see me? Yep, I can see you again. You you, you left for a second, but you're back. All right, are we good? Um, yeah, you have some low FPS, but I think you're good. I can hear your audio just fine. Um, okay, let's see. My regular system just got back online. So okay. that one is obviously higher quality. I yeah. assume it won't have exactly the same problem. We just did. Let's assume. Yes, let's assume this. Okay, so let's see. That'll take like another minute or two to that's okay. for the regular can, uh, system. To... That's okay. okay. I can dance. It will be okay. Okay. I'll see you soon. Okay. All right. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the thing about kids, I am going to ask him about this at some point, um, which is um, I'm curious if there is an economic case for having kids. Like, that's awesome. Um, I hope that's true. But um, in my experience, I wasn't aware of that. So I'm definitely curious to ask him. Um, and then 
the case against education, I think, is interesting and also extremely relevant to today. Um, you know, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, who's one of the presidential candidates, has promised to basically, along with gut the FBI, he wants to essentially gut um, gut the uh, the federal organization, the Department of Education. Um, which, for those who don't know, the federal Department of Education was only created pretty recently under Jimmy Carter. Before then, it was all um, local, um, which is, you know more in line with the Federalist vision that the founders originally had and that the American tradition abided by for uh, most of its existence. Uh, So um, there's lots of different arguments against the Department of Education from a constitutional perspective, but I think he's going to be making a practical case about how it's made education actually worse. I did experience Common Core. I knew that was a federal thing. I didn't like it. So, um, you know, I'm sympathetic to the view. Um, but, you know, when Vivek Ramaswamy gets up there and he says, I'm going to s- destroy the uh, Federal Department of Education, people tend to like kind of balk at that um, because Vivek likes to be kind of fiery and likes to be kind of like shocking. I, it's his brand um, at the moment. Um, but I understand many people think that's insane. But in reality, it's kind of just returning to the status quo of like 40 years ago. Um and the last thing I want to talk to him about was immigration, because he has a book about immigration. And I think he was a book up against immigration, which unless you're a national, I mean, he seems like a market guy. Um, and he seems like a market guy in a way where he's not protectionist because of the conversation that we have with truckers. So I'm curious for the economic case against immigration. Um, I think you can make that case on a nationalist level, but you definitely can't um potentially but um i'm not aware how you'd make it on like a globalist efficiency level um so we'll see what he sees on that i'm very curious the last question i'm going to ask him is a question that i don't know which is what's the difference between an austrian economist and a uh, market economist um um, because he seems to be very market oriented i I find myself pretty very market oriented as well you know i got a thomas sowell book back here uh which i really enjoy um but he seems to be kind of dunking on the Austrians while also defending markets to a pretty large extent, um, to a pretty uh, hard line extent. So I'm going to be, uh, I'll probably ask you about the difference there uh, whenever he returns back to us, which uh, should be imminently. Um, but no, it's been really interesting so far. Um, for those who don't know, uh, I, myself, Don Don, Tart, and uh, Thomas all talked to Vosch, who is not a market oriented person. He's a market socialist technically, but he's, he's more of a lefty on economics. He wants to get rid of the stock market um, with his other large opinions. And we talked to him yesterday on the Royal Rumble. So if after this, you want to hear how the other side thinks about economics, you want to hear me talking to somebody who I don't agree with and who, dis- who I disagree with, uh, please go check out that live stream. You can find it on Rumble. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. Um, it's on my channel on YouTube and it's on the Pangburn channel on Rumble. Um, you should go watch it. Um, it's, uh, it was really exciting. Um, Varsh was, um, an interesting guy, uh, to say the least. Um, he was a pretty good interlocutor, I think. Uh, he was, uh, pleasant to talk to, to, um, and, um, despite how much we disagreed. Um, so for a different perspective on economics, you should definitely go check that out. Uh, because on this channel, I talked to uh, Brian, um, I talked to Robert Breedlove, who is a Bitcoin guy. So we've been talking to a lot of like kind of right wing market guys. For So for a different perspective, go check out that stream. However, our um, our famed guest, uh, Brian Kaplan, has in fact returned. Uh, American Libertarian Economist is back. Makes me so happy. I think we're all squared away here. I th- hope so. Yes. Being squared away. <laughs> I, uh, I have I have trust in the vibes. So right. I know where I left off, um, which is, um, I think I know the answer to this, but just so you lay it out, how exactly does housing deregulation solve the problem of out-of-work truckers? Yeah, great question. Well, it does require that truckers be capable of doing construction work. Not yeah. all would, not all would be, but they are not so different in a lot of ways. So, like especially if you've got some kind of mechanical skill, easily goes into doing all kinds of construction. A lot of people have both already. Um, so, basically, if you deregulate housing right now, we build a lot less housing than we are 
physically and economically capable building because it's so hard to get those pieces of paper which allow the construction yeah. to happen. Red tape. Yeah. If you yeah. deregulate, then there will be a lot more building. And when you build a lot more, you'll hire a lot more construction workers, which is a very natural place for people that are currently truckers to go. Um, yeah. Of course, very, and very, very important to remember in general, something hasn't, doesn't have to be a solution for everyone to be a solution for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. That's um, you know, what's interesting is that people talk about this, um, about why we should have self-driving trucks. And they kind of talk vaguely about creative destruction um, and I always think I'm like, well, that doesn't really help the truckers who are out of work um, in the short term. So it's nice to hear somebody give like an actual yeah. policy plan. That, right. Like, I mean, this is my answer just for national conservatives, too. There's a lot of people yeah. who are very concerned about especially working class males say they just don't really fit well with service sector jobs. We got to go and put up big trade barriers to revive our manufacturing industry or manufacturing. And my response to that is, why are you trying to go and revive something where people are already pretty maxed out on the amount of manufactured goods that they would want yeah. when we are so understocked in housing, which yeah. you know, it's, it, it is the second most basic human need. And we have built so little and it's something almost everybody wants. And it's something that it's, it's is a, is a natu natural occupation for working class males. And it's yeah. just been strangled by regulation for 50 years. Like, it's oh, unbelievable. Break the dam, unle unleash the river, man. It's unbelievable how long it's been true, too. Like, you, like for 50, it just feels so demented. Um, the other thing, though, that I hear, especially from my friends on the left, is that another part of the reason for high housing prices is due to BlackRock and similarly large companies uh, buying up a ton of property. And then and then owning it all and then selling it at um, higher market prices because they just own so much of a market share. Um, is that a concern for you? Um, yeah, that's, you? Just, that's basically just a crazy conspiracy theory. I wouldn't put it. Yeah, what makes, what makes you say that? Because to my to my mind, the idea of a very rich entity mm -hmm. buying up enough of the supply that they can raise the price seems like pretty, you know, ABC logic. So. Yeah. Um, what is the actual percentage of any major city that's owned by any one company? And again, it's you know, this is one of the most deconcentrated industries in the country, in the world. And again, the main thing that developers want to do, I'll just say, like, like, you know, so it sounds like those are not developers. But anyway, the main kind of lobbying that's going on in this industry is people begging for permission to build more stuff. The main thing going on is not trying to go and restrict supply. The main thing going on is trying to go get permission to have any, have supply. Yeah. So yeah, this is. I, mean, I can cool. lower the prices for you. Just let me build more. Yeah, yeah. So, like, and then, you know, you know, of course, like, like you know, individual builders are probably not sitting around thinking, "Oh, my goal here is to go and make housing cheap." Their goal is to make money. But, right, but anything we learn from Adam Smith, it's that the individual desire to make money leads to larger, uh, leads to higher supply, which in the which leads to at the social level to lower prices. Right. Right. And that's that's definitely a good thing. And then you could also make the argument that um, the higher supply, even if you believed in the BlackRock thing, if you actually increase that much of a supply, that would also mm. kind of solve the problem by diluting yeah. the size of the market share anyway. Um, yeah. So, yeah, definitely interesting. Um, definitely agree on the deregulation. Again, I come from California, which is just like the yeah, capital me too. of me too. regulation. And it's, it's just it's just the most unbelievable thing you've ever seen. So, you know, demented policies. Um, do you know why they haven't deregulated it yet? Do you, do you know what the incentives are there on the governmental level um, for why? Well, you I mean, know? remember a myth of the rational voter, a government's responding to voters. I mean, people, almost everyone understands that people who own homes are unsympathetic to a new construction. What most people don't realize is that most people who rent are unsympathetic to new construction, too. Why? Severe economic illiteracy. Most people do not agree that a higher supply leads to lower prices. They just have oh, some God. crazy conspiracy theory where it's a plot by rich fat cats to go and take your money from you. And the idea that look, they're uh, building things will you know, leads, to, leads to more production, which leads to lower prices, is just rejected by much of the population. I'd say actually only a minority of the population accepts the, uh, this basic truth. Right? Uh, furthermore, a lot of it is just Every complaint about housing that people have, they're not wrong. They're just petty and not important. Not if someone says, oh, well, we'll build, uh, skies will block my legs. Like, yep, so it will. Tough luck. Build. Right? Or like, oh, no, this could go and disrupt some migratory birds. Yeah, I suppose it will. Tough luck. Let's build. Right? And as long yep. as people are willing to go and destroy billions of dollars of value for $100 complaints, 
then we're going to have these problems. Right. Um, I think that what people who say that they're having their views destroyed would argue is that I didn't just buy the house. I bought mm -hmm. it for the view. And therefore, right. in some ways, you're violating my property. Yeah. Yeah. Your yeah. Property. So you've got a property right to have the entire world revolve around you. Yeah. That's, well, not, how, it, that's, that's not how property rights work. Property rights, you have a specific property right in this exact piece of property and everything yeah. else belongs to other people. And, and, if the, and if they do what you want, you're great. And if they don't, tough luck. That's, the, that, that is the traditional yeah. system, of course. Uh, yeah, in the night, you know, so the, like I said, there's a famous Supreme Court case in the 1920s that was the big violation of a thousand years of Anglo American property law, which did change what you're able to do. You know, so it's true that you know, for about 800 years, there have been rules about how someone does physical damage to your property. If they do smoke, if they have a pig farm with horrible odors, you can sue them for that. Basically, it was a very short list of complaints that got any attention at all. And even to get those dealt with, you had to go and fight it out in court, big pain in the, ne pain, pain in the neck, which is a feature, not a bug, as we now see. Because yep. human beings are just such giant complainers. If you listen to them too much, then they will just crush progress. You've got to go right. and have your first, second, and third response to a complaint be, yeah, yeah, too bad, tough luck. And only if someone really persists should you listen to them. Right. Rationally, rationality. Yep. 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 Um, I w and also, it should be noted that most of the zoning regulations that are strangling people aren't just like, oh, I want to protect my view. Um, mm -hmm. Correct. It's well, you know, there's there's so many different ones. Unlimited. You know, in, 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 term, in terms of the main, so like in cities, the big deal is regulating t tall buildings. And you know, a lot of that is about blocking views and that kind of thing and you know, blocking my light. Uh, but you know, other really important ones, once you get out of cities, there's a lot of regulations saying that you are not allowed to have multifamily housing. So you can only have single family homes, which is a big deal because uh, you know, a lot of times apartments or townhomes are the much more profitable thing to make. And yeah. that's not allowed. Another really big deal is saying that every single family home has to have at least an acre of land. That's unbelievable. I've got an acre of land. There's enough land to go and put 10 homes. Well, you can't do 10 homes. You can only do one. Right. So yeah. That's a big deal. You're, not, you're not allowed to meet the demand. That's yes. we want people to be demanding. Like, it's just like trying to project what you want to something that's just not compatible with the reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. It's uh, right. You know, you know, there's the reality of some people don't want to have dense housing near them. But it's like, yeah, well, if we listen to you, we're going to choke off progress and we're, we're done listening to you. And also, more people disagree. More people would rather like you've, you've been outvoted economically speaking as well. Right. Unfortunately, they are be there. The opposite is true, politically speaking. And guess yeah. what? Uh, it's politics where the votes count. Yeah, well, uh, that's the unfortunate feature of democracy, which I talk about in my new book, Unbeatable. You know, markets yeah. do the good stuff that sounds bad. And the government does yeah. the bad stuff that sounds good. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm stealing that quote forever now. I'm keep I'm keeping that forever. Uh, just so you know that. Um, OK, so I want to move on to a couple of the yeah, other topics in your books. Uh, just a bit of a speed round because we're running out of time here. Um, you made an economic case for people having kids. Do I have mm -hmm. that right? A selfish case for kids. Yes. No, I, I love reason to have more kids. Yeah, I think families are great and moral and necessary and we're below replacement rates. But as far as I'm aware, conventional wisdom is that part of the reasons why childbirth has dropped, besides just cultural reasons of us not taking it seriously anymore, is because we don't need farmhands anymore. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to explain to me what the economic case here mm -hmm. is. Uh, for the modern Western world to have, for people to have more kids because I don't see it. So I'm curious. Yep. Yeah. Great question. Yep. So just to be clear, the farmhands argument never made any sense either. Oh, did it not? <laughs> right. Because, you know, you suppose you got a farm and it's like, well, we need workers on our farm. Uh, we could either hire adults who already know how to do the job, or we could go and have a baby who will be completely incompetent for many years, prevent his mom from doing farm work for years, and then we'll go and put in all the effort to go and train him, and then eventually he'll be an adult, and maybe he'll go and help us for less the market wage unless he decides that he doesn't feel like working on the farm and leaves. So uh, the general view here, like even am among economic historians, is that having kids has never been a good business venture. Right. right. And I'm totally down with that. That's just common sense. Yeah. Then it's like, well, then why did anybody ever have kids for consumption, for consumption? Kids are consumer good and always have been a consumer good. It's like saying, what's the economic case for owning a television? 
It's like, yeah, because I like watching TV. What's the economic case for having kids? Yeah, because I like having kids. And you say, well, that's weird. It's like, it's not weird at all. What would Charles Darwin say? It's like, why would people want to have kids? Well, if a million years ago, there were cavemen who said, oh, kids, boring. No want kids. And then well, then they didn't have any kids. And guess what? We're not descended from those cavemen. We're descended yep. from the cavemen that did like kids, just like every other mammal that you know of. All right. So I would just start by saying, like, you know, there's never, uh, never been a, uh, a profit, a, like a, a profitable investment to go and have kids, uh, like, yeah. except in rare, rare cases. You need to think about kids as a consumer product. And, that, and there, my big economic case is that people, one of the main reasons why people are having so few kids now is that they believe that this fashionable helicopter parenting style is necessary as an investment in your kid's future. There's just a very widespread view that if you don't go and give up your whole life for your kids, that they're not going to have much of a future. And there, what I talk about in my book is a pile of research on kids that are adopted and twins showing that the effect of parenting on kids' adult outcomes is actually very small, mm. which means that it is just false to think that you need to go and ruin your life in order to give your kids a decent future. And once you accept that truth, the obvious thing to do is stop doing stuff that you really don't like for your kids because you're not giving them the long run benefit. And then step two is to rethink the number of kids that you want. You know, it's basically imagine that you've got a computer and you think that computers have the a crash rate of 50%. So 50% of the time you turn them on, they'll do what they just did to us, where it would go like, Zzzz. all right, well, if you think that's true, you're probably not going to be very interested in having a computer. On the other hand, if you realize, oh, that's actually something that only happens one time in a thousand, it's like, oh, well, in that case, maybe I'll want one. So yeah. that's the heart of the book is just getting people to rethink the uh, like what it uh, how it actually is that parents affect their kids' outcomes, and then once you do that, uh, obviously affect the way they raise your kids, but also then affect how many kids you want to have. I um I have to say to you, this is perhaps I'm just a little bit dense, but it's, it's somewhat difficult for me to see why this is an economic case at this point. Ah, well, from because it's about price. So, like, imagine if I give you I, I give you a coupon twenty five twenty chocolate twenty five percent off, right? You could either say I don't like chocolate, fine, throw the coupon away. Or you can say, I like kids. Great. All right. Well, now they're 25% cheaper than your thoughts. So rethink the number you're going to have. I suppose it's the fault of my um, initial assumptions about what the argument was going to be like. Yes, yes. Because I was kind of assuming that you were going to tell yeah. me why kids are an economic benefit. No. What it seems like you're telling me is that kids are not the economic cost that everybody pretends yes, yes. That they are. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I just take it for granted. Like, okay. That's like, again, the, the idea that like kids are a reasonable investment in terms of like just getting retirement money or something. Yeah, that's ridiculous. The only error is people thinking this was ever fall. This was ever not true, right? It's yeah. not true that in, that that in an agricultural society that having kids is a good plan. It's a dumb plan. Why not hire actual competent workers who can do yeah. their job right now instead of going and having a baby who's going to be useless for many years, right? You know that was never a good the idea. Babies are good. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, be like the reason to have kids is as a consumption good. It's true today. It's true in the past, but. Okay. The problem that people have with having kids right now, in my view, is just that they have made it into a horrible chore. And I say the problem is not the kids. The problem is the parents and the false theories they have about child development. 100% agree. Um, I think that's definitely part of it. And also, I, I don't feel like people take it as seriously as like a good and moral like duty. Mm -hmm. right? as I, I right. think that's also happened as well. Yeah. You know, so, um, of course, there's, there, there's a lot of green philosophy saying that it's evil to go and even have kids. Yeah, uh, I do have yeah. a chapter talking about how, yeah, you know, human beings do some bad things to the world. They also do some great things. The great Correct. things are more important than the bad things. Yep. So that's my my big story. Hey, yeah, that's a, it's a pretty uh, solid argument, I have to say. Uh, yeah, so um, that's really interesting. I, I was when I was reading that about you, I was really confused. I was like, mm -hmm. they're not, they're not. There's no way these are economic that positive. Yeah. Uh, I will say though about the retirement thing. The odds that like your kids are going to give you enough retirement money is low, but the odds that your kids will be there to like take care of you. Yeah, you yeah, yes. I guess so, that's not exactly an economic benefit, but that is, um, I, I mean, I guess we've kind of replaced that familial system with like, mm -hmm. you know, the government mm -hmm. taking care of yeah. you when you're old, but that seems. Yeah, yeah I mean, but yeah, again, the truth is that it was, it was, it was like, as far as we can tell, it's basically never been true that young people on average helped old people. 
Never. Right? So remember, before Social Security, old people died at a much younger age. But you know, as long as they were alive, the large majority of them were, were more than pulling their weight, taking care of grandkids. Remember, yeah. retirement used to not really be a thing. So if you make it to 65, you don't retire. You just keep working. Yeah. You know, like there really never was this time when kids were on average supporting their parents. The only real exceptions are cases where like, like in East Asia, where there's some countries where the elderly were super poor and their and their kids were just way richer. Then it looks like kids actually did start making net transfers to their parents, but that's really rare. But you are right on the elder care. So yeah, one of the strongest predictors of ending up in assisted living is not having enough kids. Yeah. I mean, no kids are real likely to end up, end up in assisted living. And the more kids you have, the less likely. I um, mean, even you know, if during COVID you realize, wow, assisted living sucks. Yeah, well, there is that. Yeah, hundred percent. That was um, that was a particularly monstrous part of COVID nineteen is the elderly trapped in nursing homes and they're not allowed to see their family for years. Yep. Like that's. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Hey, this all, is the safe all, all goes option. back to you the know, safe like, option. Yeah. You know, yeah safe, safety, safety is the most important thing in the universe. Yeah. You know, quality yeah. of life is the most important thing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> this is, is one option. component of quality of life. <laughs> yeah. This is the safe option. We're going to retard an entire couple yeah. of grades of kids learning. And we're also going to trap like millions of elderly away from their families in a nursing home. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, a lot I, of them I, I did write an essay saying, like, right now, of some, being of sound mind and body, if there's ever another pandemic when I'm old, I don't want to be isolated. I want to take my chances. If I die, I die. I don't want to be alone. Yeah, yeah. Oof. Okay, uh, speed round a couple more. Um, so case against education. Uh, that's so interesting. And you know why it's interesting? It's because Vivek Ramaswamy has been talking about how he's going to obliterate the uh, Federal mm -hmm. Department of uh, mm -hmm. Education. I know right. that it's pretty recent. Um, Jimmy Carter created it way back in the day. And um, I personally have beef with the Department of Education because they're the ones who made me learn Common Core. And I was not <laughs> happy about that. Uh, so in uh, you know purely economic terms, um, when people hear this, when people hear people like Vivek say, we're getting rid of the Department of Education, they're like, oh my heavens, they want to take us back to the dark ages. Um, so what, and I understand the constitutional case against the Department of Education on a federal level. I think it violates localism pretty clearly. But on like a practical level, why do you take this position? Here's the main thing to do. Just think about all the things you had to study in school and then ask yourself, what fraction of them do I remember and, are, and, use, them, and use them in real life? Yeah. That's hardly anything. That's not a high you know, the, the, curric the curriculum is otherworldly. Most of it is not important in real life. And yet we have this strange system where you've got to go and excel in studying subjects that are irrelevant in the real world in order to actually get a good job, right? That's weird. Uh, what I do in the book is explain, first of all, why this thing is true. And the answer is that is we have a system where the way that you convince employers that you're worthy of an interview is to jump through a bunch of hoops, which while they don't actually prepare you for the job, it is a, way, a good way of convincing employers that you have the skills that you need. There's a technical name for this in economics. It's called signaling. Basically just saying that the, what you're really doing in school primarily is getting stamps in your forehead, grade A worker, grade B worker. Right now, if you say, all right, so maybe this is the purpose of education, fine. Uh, the main thing, though, is that uh, you know, if what you're learning in school is actually useful skills, then you can enrich the whole society by having people do more. But if what's the main thing happening in school is getting stamps in your forehead, you can't enrich a society by putting more stamps in everyone's forehead. Yep. Instead, what happens is that you get what's called credential inflation, where you need more degrees, more years in school to get the same jobs that your parents and grandparents were able to get with less. Sounds so, so I say, Yeah. So I say this is the fundamental problem with education is that they're teaching a bunch of useless stuff and they put us into this dysfunctional world where the only way to get a good job or the main way to get a good job is to do well in a bunch of stuff that isn't relevant. And you've just got to spend a lot of, you know, spend a lot of your years in life wasting in school. So uh, and then right. my answer for this is don't just get rid of the department of education. You know, we need severe educational austerity, make it a lot more expensive, make it a lot less accessible so that people get less and then start their lives earlier. And if I'm right about the uselessness of the curriculum, this will be totally fine. People will just be able to get jobs at an earlier age with less education because employers will no longer say, oh, you didn't go to college. Well, then you can't possibly be a good bartender. Mm. It seems um, – I will say that while I'm not sure I'm going to disagree with your fundamentals, it seems like an awfully large gamble. 
That's uh, yeah. I mean, I say, look to me. Uh, I would just say, like, I am more sure about this book than almost anything else that I've done. Well, I'm excited <laughs> to read it now. Just because, like, I, I was just I've been in, I've been in education for so, for so many decades, been in school nonstop since I was five, and the idea that what we're doing is useful in the real world, I think, is just absolutely lun- lunacy. Like, it is not. Mm-hmm. Like it's just a tiny fraction of stuff that you learn in school is useful in the real world. The rest of it is just a waste of time from a social point of view. Yeah. Right. And then like, like in the book I go over, there's a lot of other kinds of evidence. If just your own firsthand observation doesn't convince you, there's many other bizarre facts that can really only be explained by this model. Like for example, most of the financial payoff from college comes from graduation. If you're one class short of graduation, you barely get any economic benefit at all. Yeah. If, um, if, if they're teaching you useful skills, that wouldn't make any sense. But if you're trying to get a stamp on your forehead, completed the socially mandatory curriculum, other, you know, thereby showing that you are the kind of conformist person we wanted our firm, makes sense then. Well, and even if you were taught useful skills, um, if without the without the stamp, then um, it's just the, the employers aren't going to pick up on that or give that much weight, it seems. Well, but I mean, the puzzle is what if they saw that you're one class short of graduation? Why do they regard that so differently? Uh, because they think that you're not somebody who's willing to, you know, see things through to the end. They're making yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So that, that, then it's, it's yeah. the signal. It's yeah. like, ah, so he failed to do what's expected in our society. But again, if well, we like that signal was only 5% of people, people at college degrees, then you can't, employers cannot afford to be so picky. And I mean, signals aren't, those signals aren't like worthless, but they're just not really as they've been over prioritized. I think. Yeah. What I say is like socially, like we, like, we could have had a very different system where the way that you show your reliability is by getting a job and being, and being yeah. a good worker, which is the old yeah. system. It's not like in 1950, we didn't have a way of figuring out who were reliable workers. It's just the way that we did it was by saying, get a job, and then we'll see whether you can move up in this company. Now we have put so much emphasis upon education as the, as the way, right? Sure. Last thing uh, before we have to go is I have to, I have to ask you about this is, um, uh, two things. One, um, two things. One, you ca- you claim that you're pretty, you're a market economist, pretty obviously, um, but you kind of were rallying against Austrian economics. Uh, what's the difference precisely? Hmm. It's hard to explain without a big lecture. Basically, Austrian economists have this list of specific weird doctrines that distinguish them from other economists, and I'd have to go through each of the weird doctrines and say, well, here's the problem with this doctrine. But so, you know, we already mentioned one of the main ones. So there's this Austrian idea that unless you actually act upon a preference, demonstrated behavior, it does not yep. exist. Yep, that's one. Right. So yep. that's the, that the, so that is one weird one. Let's see. Uh, another strange one. Uh, Austrians have a problem with probability theory, whereas other economists say, all right, well, there's a probability this happens. There's some philosophical issue that a lot of Austrians have say, no, no, you can't say there's a 10% probability that Vivek wins the Republican primary. And it's like, Hmm, seems like I can. I just did. I said it. I understand. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I wrote it down. Look at this. Yeah. Okay. Well, that is very weird. I mean, I think I would love to expand the conversation as to what an Austrian economic philosophy requires these weird assumptions, but we cannot ask that question. I have to ask. Um, maybe we'll talk about it next time if we have you on again, which I would love. Um, but the second, the last thing I want to ask you about is immigration, because mm-hmm. I saw a book where you were making a case against immigration. Um, no, 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 no. My book is Open Borders: The Science and Ethics of Immigration. It's pro, okay. you know, like it's a pro open sense. borders book. No, yeah. I must have uh, misread. Okay, um, so pro immigration. Um, oh yeah, on the national level. Um, and so why is that? Is it just um, lower, lower, la- um, lower yeah. price labor is just good yeah, for everybody? Like the intellectually strongest economic case for immigration, again, comes down to something you can see with your own eyes. We take someone who's shining shoes in Haiti, making a dollar a day. We put him on a boat, bring him to Miami. And guess what? Suddenly he's making a hundred dollars a day. Yeah. All right. It's like, how did that happen? All right. Um, now, you know, of course, it also works you know, like if you go and bring a Mexican farmer into the U.S., take him from his uh, farm in Mexico, put him on a U.S. farm, suddenly he's, ma- you know, like he's making vastly more money. And you know, like, how can this happen? The answer is that the same labor is just vastly more productive in rich countries and in poor countries for so many reasons. Yeah. Because the labor is more productive, they make more money, which yep. isn't just good for the immigrant. It is good for humanity. 
It is good for humanity to move labor from where the product its productivity is low to where it is high. So in the case of something like agriculture, oh, sorry. So this is the pushback here, which is um, I can't. I'm not going to disagree with you that it's good for the individual and it's good for humanity on a global level. I think the concerns that have often been raised, um, interestingly, by people like Bernie Sanders, as well as people like Trump, <laughs> uh, they agree on this. And I'm somewhat sympathetic, but again, divided mind because I'm a market guy as well, is that, OK, cool. But my priority isn't if it's good for the immigrant and my priority isn't if it's good for humanity on a global level. My concern is if it's good for my nation specifically and the mm -hmm. people living here. Mm -hmm. And the people living here who are born here are getting priced out of the market by a whole bunch of low cost labor influx is bad um, on, on a national level. Do you think that that's mm -hmm. true and like just not important enough? Or do you think that that's not actually the case? Right. So, I mean, actually, the main effect on output is in the country where you go because 80% of the modern economy is services, almost all of which have to be sold to people in the country where you live. So, you know, restaurant meals and taking care of kids and, you know, deliveries and gardening. Um, but again, this is really actually almost exactly like your issue with uh, replacing truckers with robots or with driverless cars. Yeah, no, it's, it's a very right. similar. Yeah, um, so, yeah, it's the same yeah. idea. And like here, you know, here, you know, here's the simple slogan. The secret of mass consumption is mass production. Countries are rich and people have high living standards when production per person is high. And I'd say that the number one principle of economic policy is, is once you know that, stop and do it. No further discussion. That's it. Otherwise, you're just going to be listening to a million complainers coming up with a bunch of different reasons to hold back progress, which is bad on average for people, you know, for, the, for, you know, for, for natives in your country as well, to hold back that kind of progress. I mean, if you say, well, look, are there some losers? Yes, of course, there's some losers, right? Like when we let in all kinds of foreign econ professors, this is bad for me. You can take out your violin and play it for me, poor Brian. But it is the same idea. Now, in terms of you know, what about the effect on workers' wages, remember, there's two things going on with wages. There's the competition of the people that do the job that you do. But then there's also the competition for your dollars of the people who's, uh, wh wh where, you, where you purchase the products they make. Right? And you always have to remember both sides of this. When you're thinking about yourself, you have to say, all right, well, there's some immigrants here. There's more competition, but there's also more production. And then it's like, well, what actually gives me a higher living standard mm -hmm. on net? And the right. answer on average is definitely going to be whatever gives higher production on net. And for individuals, that, it does vary, right? Yeah, yeah. So maybe truckers will be worse off because of driverless cars. I don't know. Although even there, the like if you do want government to do something about it, the sensible thing is never to hold back progress. The sensible thing is to go and write a check to the people that have lost yeah. out, taking advantage of the fact that because we're richer in total, that check pays for itself and more. Yeah. So the idea is that with higher production, if you have higher production, then it kind of lowers prices and then the yes. lowering of wage doesn't Yeah, it doesn't matter. kind of lower prices. It totally does. Often right. it just means that products exist that were simply not available before. Mm. Right. So yeah. well, you know, like, like you're too young to remember travel, travel agents, the internet, this is a whole occupation that the internet essentially destroyed. Yeah. Right. So back in the old days, you know how you got a plane ticket? Called somebody. Uh, well, that was pretty sophisticated. Usually you would drive to the travel agent. Uh -huh. the phone, it was hard even to go and, and, uh, and explain your options. You have to sit down with the person. Where do you want to go? And then it's like, well, there's three different possible flights that you could take to that place. Oh my goodness. What are my choices? And they go over it. Yeah. So sometimes you call, but actually, usually I remember going in person to the travel agent and just to get like the simplest ticket for the simplest thing. And it's like, what? All right. And then will you need eating hotel there? Yes. What about hotels? All right. Well, I could either you have a choice of three hotels that you might go to. Yeah, this yeah. is an industry destroyed by the internet. That it's one where just the product as we think of it now really just didn't exist in those days, or at least it was such a shadow of what we now take for granted. And then it's because of this that your money actually is so much so much more worthwhile. You can get so much more out of it. And like, you know, just think about like any time that a business opens that you like to consume it. That really is pretty much the same thing as you got to raise. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think that I would love to talk to you more, um, especially about the diff, um, especially about the difference between Austrian economics and market economics. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about immigration, well, but usually called neoclassical economics, by the way, or although I also say behavioral economics. Sure. Neoclassical or behavioral. Very nice. Right. Um, but unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you so uh, much for being here. Um, your book is um, unbeatable, right? 
Oh, so that one is uh, still uh, you know, only half written. Um, no, right. And, right. Yeah. So I don't, you know, I've got another book coming out before that, which would be Build Baby Build: The Science and Ethics of Housing Regulation, coming out in April 2024. Mm-hmm. But all of my books are available uh, right now on Amazon. So there's I got eight books available, uh, eight books that are currently out there and available for sale. And then uh, also you can go to my Substack, which is just bet on it. Very. Good. Oh, I like that. I see, see now. I understand the joke uh, with that title. That's fun. Yes. Um, yeah, good. government uh, does bad things that sounds good, and then the markets do good things that sounds bad. I'm gonna I'm keeping that quote yep. forever. All right. Yep. Okay. That's that's the slogan right. of unbeatable. All right. Yeah. Um, it's gonna be the it's gonna be the thumbnail. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate right, having you. you on. Um, good to see you. All right. Great. Uh, great, 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 great talk. Great talking to you. Hope to talk to you again. Bye bye. Yeah, great talking to you too. Bye bye.